In the heart of America's dairy land, an odd crop is beginning to dominate the landscape. So literally 15 foot solar panels, 150 feet from my house. Did you have any say in that? No. Farmland is being sown with solar panels and causing some concerns about putting food on America's tables. In 2021, we lost about 7,000 farms. It just doesn't seem like a good solution to take some of our most productive uh, agricultural lands out of production. Nothing is more American than a burger, but the U.S. isn't the only country battling obesity and bad eating habits. How big of a battle has it been to fight, I guess, what we would call the junk food industry? It's pretty tough going. We're in London to look at how the Brits are trying to dial back its junk food obsession. It's a clash between, I guess, what I'd call cultural liberalism, which is free speech, equal treatment, due process, rational science, on the one hand, objective truth, against cultural socialism. And the issues that seem to drive our times, what we teach, what genders can play, and what sports, leading to what some call a cultural cold war. We look at what lies ahead. We haven't reached peak woke, actually. Uh, we're only at the beginning of a journey. This is gonna become more, not less, important in our politics. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. There is tension in America's breadbasket with a push for green energy running up against rural residents trying to preserve a way of life. Now some claim the stakes are even higher and could impact all of us, with a growing number of food farms being gobbled up by solar farms. Today we're off to Wisconsin where some rural landscapes are becoming a shiny sea of solar panels. This little windmill once powered a small water pump on the Polking Horns Wisconsin dairy farm. Now it's surrounded by solar panels instead of cows. Tell me about what time period the solar came and did a company approach you or did you hear about it? Yes, it was oh, 2017 when they first approached, asked us uh, interested in solar and uh, no interest. But then uh, they keep coming back to convince you. And all of a sudden, my wife and I decide, you know, we're not going to live forever. When we die, what happens to the farm? So in 2018, Bill Polkinghorne and his wife said yes to solar. They're getting paid two and a half times more to lease their land to this solar project than what a food farmer could pay. There's going to be a good income. So we decide, yep, this is it. Solar power is rising in a big way in Wisconsin, thanks partly to big federal incentives provided at taxpayer expense. Yeah, so we here are here in our Badger Hollow Solar Park. It's the largest or one of the largest solar parks east of the Mississippi and actually east of the Rockies. Brendan Conway is with WEC Energy Group, which owns six utilities companies. Why is Wisconsin such a good place for these projects that are coming in? Well, as a company, one of the things we've made a real commitment to is reducing our carbon emissions. Um, and one of the ways we're doing that is you know, generating power with clean energy. The expansion of solar is also generating controversy, pitting farmers who are leasing their land to solar farms against those who want to keep it for agriculture. Come here, come here, puppies. Oh, look at the puppies. Tara Vaspi's five-acre family homestead is nestled in a scenic spot that's looked much the same for decades. Soon it'll be surrounded on three sides by a sea of sun-soaking arrays. The fence will be right there and solar panels will be right behind it. So literally 15 foot solar panels behind an eight foot fence, 150 feet from my house. Did you have any say in that? No. I continue to say, look, we're destroying the environment in order to save it and it doesn't really make any sense. A 45 minute drive from Tara Vaspi's home, Elizabeth Groves lives on a small farm and is hoping to expand her micro beef operation. 
What's your concern about farmland being used for another purpose that can help people make quite a bit of money? So with what we've seen over the last two years with food shortages and supply chain issues and being told, you know, by our higher levels of government that that could possibly get worse with what's happening in Ukraine, it just doesn't seem like a good solution to take some of our most productive uh, agricultural lands, not even just in Wisconsin, but, it, you know, throughout the entire Midwest and, and the country out of production. Groves worries that leaders are losing sight of the long game, how less food farming stands to impact rural life for so many. It's going to affect uh, implement dealers and seed companies and um, feed dealers. There's going to be less product, you know, and so that's going to drive the prices up. And what is the trickle down effect going to be in, in our communities? The big city, Madison, Wisconsin, is where the solar projects go to get the green light from the Public Service Commission. Ellen Nowak is one of the commissioners. And what has been the findings so far with the recent applications for the solar farms? So, so far, you know, it, it's a mixed bag. Well, we've approved all of them that I, at least that I have been here, the large ones. Nowak says she personally favors a pause in the green energy rush to look at unintended consequences that could be coming. But she adds the commission doesn't have grounds to deny projects that meet technical requirements. You're probably always going to have people unhappy with yes. the decision. Yeah, it's tough because you see small towns, you see people neighbor against neighbor. Um, but at the end of the day for us, it's a person's right to lease their property as they wish. And if, as long as it's compatible, you know, I'm not one to judge that they can't do that. Wisconsin already has more than 20 solar farms, with at least a half dozen more large-scale projects on the way. With other states following suit, the battle between food farms and solar farms is bound to grow more heated. Adding fuel to the fire, the Biden administration's recent climate change law. It extended and expanded tax benefits given for solar systems, meaning more are on the way. And the reason these uh, wind and solar developers can offer $1,000 an acre is there's these rich subsidies that are coming from the federal government incentivizing this. It could be as much as $50,000 an acre that they can get via these subsidies from the federal government. That's what's driving this. Congressman Tom Tiffany of Wisconsin is pushing for a bill that removes those subsidies for wind and solar projects if they're put on food farms. You can still build these facilities. Um, you just can't build it on productive agricultural land, as we're seeing in the Midwest. And I think as we see food shortages looming around the world, that we need to be very cognizant of making sure that we don't take productive agricultural land out of production. To me, that is the highest and most important um, public policy that we can implement, is making sure that our people are fed. Even Tiffany admits his bill stands little chance of passing. Um, as a company, we've set... And Conway, with the Wisconsin Utilities Company, says worries about the food supply are unfounded. You could produce 50% of the state's energy needs using solar power, and it would use less than 1% of the farmland um, in the state. We're participating. Four years after he cut the deal to lease his land, Bill Polkinghorne says there have been a few snags with the solar company, but he professes no regrets for himself and no worries for America as more land is converted from farming food to farming green energy. Are you concerned about farmland, though, being bought out or used up or leased by, replaced by solar and wind on a big scale? I'm not worried about our country ever going short of food. Maybe they won't be able to export as much as they are, but... Uh... No, it's, it's the, the very small percentage of land going into these projects. It's not going to hurt the total output. In one Virginia county where there are seven solar projects proposed or already built, the Planning Commission is proposing to limit solar farms to 2% of prime farm soils. Ahead on Full Measure, we are off to England with an unexpected turn of events in the Battle of the Bulge.
We love our junk food, though we've long known it's not good for us and contributes to the obesity epidemic. When COVID came, we learned that the virus is more likely to make obese people sicker. For the UK, that created the opportunity for them to pass some of the toughest restrictions in the world on junk food ads aimed at kids. It seemed like a no-brainer, but here's what we learned when we flew to Great Britain to find out more. The food and beverage industry spends billions of dollars each year yeah! on ads targeting teens oh, and featuring celebrities and social media influencers. Tomatica Oreo. More than 80% of the products are unhealthy, according to one study. Two thirds of adults here in England are overweight or obese, according to Britain's National Health Service. As in the US, the trend starts early and is growing. In England, more than 25% of kids aged 10 and 11 qualify as obese. So in July 2020, Great Britain launched a new anti-obesity strategy, proposing some of the strictest advertising restrictions in the world. Limits on where junk food can be displayed in stores, a ban on buy one, get one free ads for junk food, a ban on junk food TV ads before 9 p.m., and a total ban on advertising junk food online to anyone. And so the online one is particularly novel and it's really, really exciting. Mimi Tatlow Golden studies the impact of junk food ads on kids at the Open University. Because we all know that there's loads of advertising online and that um, advertising, the whole ad advertising technology sort of ecosystem is scraping people's data, using it to design advertising and target it more particularly at whoever might be vulnerable to it. So dialing down that advertising is really, really important. So the digital ban is for everybody, it's not just for kids. Polling shows the British people widely support the idea of dialing back on junk food ads and all of the restrictions were scheduled to be in effect in January of this year, but... Um, it's now been paused. Um, depends who you ask what the reason for that might be. Um, the government has said it's due to um, the cost of living crisis um, and, you know, what they suggest might be the effect on, on advertisers and on, on people's purchasing. How big of a battle has it been to fight, I guess, what we would call the junk food industry? I've got to say it's pretty, it's pretty tough going and it goes on and on and on. And no matter what is proposed, they come back with something as yet another idea why this might not be a good um, idea. The only provision that wasn't put off is the one restricting where junk food and sugary drinks can be placed in stores. That took effect last October. And, you know, the funny thing about it, Cheryl, is that um, when they're talking about what they do in terms of advertising, the industry tends to suggest that advertising isn't that effective. And yet, you know, we know they're spending billions on, on carrying out this kind of advertising and they're not foolish. The Food and Drink Federation in the UK pushed for and praised the delays in most of the ad restrictions. It says that by instituting them, the government's own estimates suggest businesses across the country will be hit by costs of over one billion pounds a year, while the measures are not expected to impact rates of obesity. Stella Creasy is a member of parliament and also supports the junk food ad limits. A lot of junk food is very cheap, not just easy to get, but inexpensive. Yeah, and one of the things that we're all looking at is the impact of sugar in the way that we look at the impact of carbon on our communities. The critical thing for me is that you can't do these things to people, you have to do them with people. You have to make it easier and cheaper for people to make those healthy choices. You know, in my community, half of people are now living with a lifetime condition, whether it's something like diabetes or heart disease and cancer, and we know that diet is part of it. So for me, for governments to ignore that means that we're ignoring the health outcomes of our local communities, and that's not right. Britain's rules to get tough on junk food ads now may be delayed until at least 2025. These are said to be some of the strictest marketing restrictions in the world. Maybe the other side would say, it's a free country. It's up to parents to monitor what their kids put in their mouth and what they even see online and on TV. What would you say to that? I would say, um, 
it is up to parents um, and it's up to parents to teach their children and for kids to learn. Uh, but I would say you need to create a level playing field. And you can't, as a parent, fight the might of the big food and marketing corporations. So I would say, sure, I'm not saying you can't manufacture that stuff, but if you're going to advertise it and become part of the lived experience of a family, then what you're doing is you're skewing the pitch and you're saying, you parents are not in charge, we're in charge, we're telling the kids what to love and now you have to try and fight us. And that seems to me to be fundamentally unjust. Fast food chains alone are set to spend about $5 billion on advertising each year. When we come back, the rise of cultural socialism. From battles over what our kids should be taught to whether men should be allowed to play in women's sports, we are in the throes of a cultural cold war. That's an argument made by Eric Kaufman, professor of politics at Birkbeck College, University of London. Kaufman says traditional cultural liberalism is being challenged by the rise of what he calls cultural socialism. Now what it is, it's, it's a clash between, I guess what I'd call cultural liberalism which is free speech, equal treatment, due process, rational science, on the one hand, objective truth, against cultural socialism, which is really about, you know, the most important uh, value is protecting um, these minority groups from any kind of psychological harm, and we need equal outcomes. If we don't have, if there's any race gap, gender gap, that's automatic evidence of white privilege and patriarchy and white supremacy. Uh, you know, so this is sort of the, the ideology that's challenging cultural liberalism, which has been really the sort of operating model for our societies. Did you come up with the term cultural socialism? <laughs> yeah, I just think this is the best term to describe what we're talking about, which in, in, in simple terms is about transposing the oppressor-oppressed radical transformation uh, framework from Marxism onto uh, a cultural plane of identity groups. So it's not about class anymore, but it's about race, gender, sexuality. And that's sort of the simplest way to understand what we're in. There's so much dominant culture talk in the United States, at least, about these social movements, whether it's promoting awareness and advocacy for transgender agendas or critical race theory, these sorts of things. What are you finding? Is that a majority opinion when you take polls that believes these are front and center issues and agree with them, or are these minority opinions? As a general rule, it's two against for everyone in favor of these positions. Now, what's a bit worrying, at least from my perspective, is if you take people under the age of 25 or under the age of 30, it's more like one to one. We're getting a younger generation that is more intolerant and more steeped in this ideology of cultural socialism. And this is why I tell people we haven't reached peak woke actually. Uh, we're only at the beginning of a journey. This is going to become more, not less, important in our politics. How do you explain if it's generally a minority view, a position to advocate for all of these causes that some people think are fringe? Right. Then why is it so dominant in our culture, our politics, our celebrity, and our society? Well, I think that the institutions where it's worst tend to be the most left-leaning institutions like universities, Hollywood, publishing houses, and, and so on. Um, the second thing, of course, is that the t nature of the taboos that exist in our society around race, around sexism, around homophobia, etc., the powerful taboos, create an uneven playing field, particularly in institutions. So even a small group can play on these taboos to actually frighten people and gain the moral high ground. So the, the, the nature of those taboos creates a terrain that's favorable to small groups of activists and gives them a, a lot of leverage to sort of multiply their power. What do you think is the appeal of these movements and these ideas? Well, I think that these ideas, they, they're building, uh, you know, on, on previous waves of 
you could call it indoctrination, you could call it education. So much of our morality has, has been based on this idea of, you know, defending the weak against the strong. Uh, and, and the cult of victimhood and the valorization of historically marginalized groups, the, the, the stories, the movies, uh, are, are about, you know, slavery and Holocaust, and, and which, which of course is fine, except we don't get movies and stories that we know about the Cultural Revolution and the atrocities committed by socialist regimes. And so people only get one kind of uh, inoculation and not the other kind. What is your observation about, in the big picture, where this leads? What impact it has? Well, I think it has enormous impact. It's, it's not just about loss of freedom of speech, which of course it has. What that then also leads to is polarization and division. So if you can't really talk about immigration levels, controlling the border, dealing with violent crime, incarceration in an effective way that would re reduce crime, if that is seen as racist in some way and mainstream politicians won't go there, then the only people who will go there are the populists. And we saw that with Trump on the border. We see that in Sweden Democrats, just to take a populist party here in Europe uh, on, on immigration levels. That, that's just a couple of examples of where then populists can exploit uh, the silence of the mainstream, the consensus, uh, which is very narrow. Coffin plans to publish a book on the topic, The Rise of Cultural Socialism. After a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure. The debate over the status and success of Asian Americans in society. So the Asian community, because we don't meet the, the narrative of the minorities who need help, they won't call us minorities anymore. They start using other names like white adjacent. I grew up in a Buddhist family in a Muslim country and I became a Christian at uh, the age of 20. And so to call me something other than a minority, it's, it's kind of insulting. How America's top science and technology high school threw out its merit-based admissions test to reduce the number of Asians and clear the way for other minorities next week on Full Measure. And a reminder, there are several ways you can watch Full Measure from home or on the go, including downloading the free STIR app on your phone or on Roku, Apple TV, or Fire. And if you want to hear more great stories, I hope you check out my podcast, Full Measure, after hours, wherever you like to listen. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching. We'll leave you now with a few scenes from our trip to London.